If we display our valuing the world, we worship the world. If we display our valuing God, we worship God. And therefore, the renewing of the mind to value God and his ways is the preparation for all of life as worship. So how do we renew our minds so that every part of life is an act of worship? That's the question John Piper answers from Romans 12, 1 and 2 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on November 30th, 1997. If it's true that the inward essence of worship is a being satisfied with all that God is for us in Jesus or a cherishing of Christ as gain, that explains why all of life is worship. Because all of life becomes either an expressing of what you are satisfied by or a questing for more satisfaction of where you think it can be found. All of life. Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. That is, do all as worship, which means let let orange juice drinking and the way you drink it And the feelings that you have when you drink it magnify God by showing that you're satisfied in Him, not the orange juice. And the Christian life is figuring out how to do that. There is a way to do that. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is all about worshiping God in your everyday life. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good, acceptable and perfect. So what this verse says is that the presenting of your bodies to God as a sacrifice is worship. So what is that? What's that referring to? A sacrifice is usually dead. They slit its throat, bleed all over the altar. It's dead. But he says, no, no, I don't want you to make the comparison that way. It is a living sacrifice. So he rules out human sacrifice. And then it says uh, in the Old Testament that they were usually eaten by the priests, so they didn't exist anymore. So a, a sacrifice not only was killed, it disappeared. And clearly he would say, that's not what I have in mind. That's not the analogy. Because back in chapter 6, this word Present your bodies three times. Present your members, present your members, present your members. That means arms, legs, eyes, tongue, sexual organs. Present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. That is, as instruments in the hands of God whereby righteousness will be manifest in the world. So clearly, the sacrifice offered to God neither is dead, or maybe it is, we'll come back to that in a minute, nor does it go out of existence, but really exists, really acts, does things in the world. So how is it a sacrifice? What does this mean? Present your bodies as a holy and acceptable sacrifice and worship to God. Now, the way I'm going to answer that question is by suggesting to you that the connection between verse 1 and 2 is that verse 1 is speaking in 
symbols, offer yourself as a sacrifice, that sacrifice will be an act of worship. And verse 2 explains the symbols with language that is more realistic. And my justification for making that connection is the link in the word acceptable. Notice, look at verse 1. Present your bodies holy and acceptable to God. And then that one word turns up again in verse 2 where it says that the renewed mind is to prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable. So I, I get a clue here that using your body to do the acceptable will of God is like or explains the offering of your body to God as an acceptable sacrifice. So if you're with me there, then what we can do here is land on verse 2 for a few minutes and poke around in there and try to understand the dynamics of what's going on here in this thing and then let it explain verse 1 instead of just guessing what verse 1 might mean ourselves. So let's look at verse 2. It has a negative statement, a negative command, and a positive command. The negative command says, don't be conformed to this world. The positive says, be transformed. Now, I just want to stop there and urge you to do that. These are present tense, ongoing commands. This is not something that happens instantaneously on the day you were converted. That's a beginning, it's not an ending. Go on this morning and this afternoon unconforming yourself to the world. Do that this afternoon. Think of something in your life that looks like the world in a way that it shouldn't. And unconform yourself. Take it off. Or positively, be about the business of becoming more and more transformed. I wonder how many fatalists there are in the room. Don't raise your hand. Fatalists who, who say, I'm just this way. This is the way it is. It's so wrong. That's so wrong. The Bible is all about change. Daily change. If it takes 20 years, give it 20 years. But don't coast. Don't get up and say, K Sarah, Sarah, I prayed to receive Jesus. Don't do that. So many professing Christians sell their birthright at this point. Give it away and drift from God. Live lives at best of disobedience. Now how? How to do this? How do you unconform yourself to the world? How do you become transformed so that the will of God would become doable. It says, not, well, look what the world is wearing. Look what the world is watching and listening to and buying and playing. Make a list. Don't do them. It's not what it says. That's, that's a good way to become a hypocrite, a legalist, with a nice Pharisaic cup, clean on the outside and filthy with self-righteousness on the inside. It's not what the verse says. The verse says something very deep and very profound that we all need to be about. It says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now that's inside. We're talking inside work here. The mind is inside. Don't be conformed, be transformed mainly from the inside. 
by the renewing of your mind. Now, what does that mean? What is the renewing of the mind? The NASB says that we should uh, be renewed in our mind so that we might prove what is the will of God. Now, this little word prove is a tremendously important word. I'm making almost this entire sermon hang on the meaning of this word. It has two pieces to it. Those of you who have NIVs will notice that two words are used to translate this one verb. And that's okay because it's very hard to bring this word over into one English word. The two meanings of the word dokimazo are to test something like gold to see if it's pure and then having tested it, approve it for what you have found it to be truly. So it's both a, a, a mental testing thing and an emotional approving thing in this word. You can track it down, the use of it in the New Testament, and it's used both of those ways. In some places, like here, I think both are implied. So the NIV, I think, says, I jotted it down here, then you will be able to test and approve. That's one word. Test and approve what God's will is. So the root issue here, I'm going to argue, the root issue in transformation and the use of your bodies to do the will of God and thus present yourself to Him as a sacrifice that is pleasing to Him and His worship in all of life, the root issue is whether when you sniff the will of God, you love it. You approve it. That's the root issue in worship. Let me illustrate the difference here so you get it. Um, suppose you're an old uh, panhandler and uh, you've got this little business of looking for gold, you know. At least I only saw this on television, so I don't know if it's the way they did it. You'll take a pan in a stream, scoop up some stones, shake it around until you see some yellow. and That's what they always did in the westerns anyway. And suppose that you want to do this and you hire a poor, uneducated, unsuspecting hillbilly who doesn't even know gold exists, let alone that it's valuable. And you hire him and you show him the nuggets. You say, this is gold and this is gold and this is gold and this is stone and this is stone and this is stone. Don't pick out the stones, pick out the gold. I'll pay you 50 cents a day to help me find these little yellow stones. Really? 50 cents a day? Wow, okay. And so he sits there accurately testing the stones. He's accurate. Get a big bag of stones and go off and become rich. And he goes with his 50 cents back into the hills. That, that would be the way many people live the Christian life. This, this, this will of God here has yellow color and it's so softer than a stone. It must be gold. So I will put it in my gold bag and not love it as gold. No approving, no delighting, don't know it's valuable. A lot of externalism. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He's not saying read enough books, listen to enough tapes, sermons, so that you can spot a good deed when you see it. And then work up the discipline to do it. He is saying, be made new in your minds. So that you can not only 
spot gold, but love gold. Approve of gold, cherish gold, treasure gold. Be like a miser with the will of God. Oh, there's another opportunity to do the will of God. I love the will of God. It's more than a logic lesson, isn't it? Christianity is more than a logic lesson. Jonathan Edwards helped me with this a long time ago when he discussed the way that you can decide whether a certain material is sweet. So here you are, and you've got some stuff in front of you, and the question is, is this sweet? And you look at it and you say, it's brown, and it's gooey, and it came from a beehive, and if you put water in it, it gets all icky and crystallized, and if you put it on toast, it makes a two-year-old's eyes light up. So it must be honey. And I know, logically, from my experience, that honey is sweet. Therefore, I declare, this stuff is sweet. And there people live their Christian lives. They may not be able to eat it because it's all logic. Their Christian life is just one inference after another and no experience. And Jonathan Edwards says, the reason many simple, uneducated people live lives vastly superior in holiness to many educated Christians is because they taste and see that the Lord is good. And they don't use long chains of reasoning. A godly person who has experienced verse 2 of Romans 12 can smell sin before it gets close enough to contaminate. And they run the other way. Smell it. They prove Both what is the will of God and by implication they prove what is not the will of God and therefore their sensory spiritual powers are such that they are drawn quickly to the one and repel the other quickly even before they can give any rational reasons. You know, if you're a parent, it's the way it's been for me anyway in rearing four boys and I presume it will be with Talitha, that they'll say to me, oh, what's wrong with that? And I'll say, what's wrong with this? Okay, what's wrong with this music? Or what's wrong with this hour? Or what's wrong with this talk? And I'll say, I'll tell you tomorrow what's wrong with it. Just don't do it tonight. And I go down, sit at my desk, it takes about a half an hour, and I write down what's wrong with it. Now, that does not mean I'm living my life as a hypocrite. It means I've got spiritual taste buds. I can taste wrong. Fifty-two years have not been lived in vain with Jesus. Well, 46 of them with Jesus. And theology is important. But you know why this is unbelievably important for your daily life? 95% plus of the choices you make every day, you do not premeditate. You just do them. Words come out of your mouth, not after any long sequence of reasoning that this is the chosen word for the moment. It's just there. Where did it come from? It came either from a renewed mind or an old mind. Which is why Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mind and the heart are overlapping realities in biblical thinking. So now let's just step back and try to see these two verses together and wrap it up. The root of Christian living, we've said now, 
is, from verse 2, this word prove, it is assessing truly and valuing accurately and approving strongly and treasuring passionately. That's the inner deep change. It begins with new birth and then it goes on and on in our gradual conformity, not just to deeds like Jesus, but to affections like Jesus and values like Jesus and treasures like Jesus. We love what He loves. We hate what He hates. We feel what He feels. We assess the way He assesses, cherish what He cherishes. That's the marvel that makes you a free person. You see, someday in heaven, when it's all done, we will all do only and exactly what we totally want to do. That's freedom. Here, the old self stays clamoring at us, commending stupid behaviors to us so that we want wrong things and must fight and do things like gouging out eyes and cutting off hands and reckoning ourselves dead. All of that belongs to fighting the fight of faith because we're not yet in heaven. But our goal is to want what He wants and therefore be free. And how many people wanting freedom rewrite the book to conform to the want It won't work. And so, being changed, we are then transformed, verse says, verse 2 says, to do the will of God, that is this wonderful pattern of life that accords with the newness of the inside. And then in verse 1, if I'm right, that these verses go together like interpretation to symbol, what is the worship, what is the sacrifice that we offer to God? Practically, it would go like this. You get up in the morning and you come to God and you say, I am coming. I'm coming, like to the altar. And I ask you now to do something positive and negative in my life. Negatively, I want you to slay me. That is, all the values, all the treasuring, all the cherishing, all the desiring, all the willing that does not accord with what is good, acceptable, and perfect, kill me. Remember how Paul put it? I have been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to me. So we offer ourselves up first on the negative side to be killed. And then we say, and would you now awaken afresh and bring to life new treasures, new values, new virtues, new beauties, new things to find acceptable so that I can prove them and approve them. And then we get up off our knees and with our hands and our eyes, and especially our tongues, and our sexual organs, we enter life as displayers of what we value. Either the will of God or the world. If we display our valuing the world, we worship the world. If we display our valuing God, we worship God. And therefore, the renewing of the mind to value God and His ways is the preparation for all of life as worship. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper will preach a sermon titled, Treasuring Christ in the Lord's Supper in our series, What is True Worship? I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.